Hello and very welcome. My name is Dr. Lucas de Plessis. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Mechanical and Aeronautical Engineering at the University of Pretoria and I will be lecturing postgraduate dynamics with a module code MSD780. So I do hope that you will find it very interesting and that you will learn something and that you will obviously also enjoy it. Okay, so in this course we will be using um, the textbook Planar Multibody Dynamics, the second edition. The author is Professor Parvitz Nikravesh from the University of Arizona. So just the acronym that I will be using is PMD for Planar Multibody Dynamics. Okay, the way that I will be presenting the lectures is I will very much use or often will be using uh, mind maps that I've created in the open source software called FreePlane. Okay, so uh, in today's lecture, uh, we will be looking at chapter one of PMD, or Planar Multibody Dynamics, the introduction. And what you see here is the objective. It's the objective of this module and obviously also of the textbook to present computational analysis techniques that can be applied systematically to systems composed of non-deformable bodies undergoing large planar motion regardless of their complexity. Right, so non-deformable bodies, in other words rigid bodies, is an obviously a, an assumption because all bodies in reality will deform once a force is applied to it. But if the deformation is small relative to the motion of the body, this assumption of non-deformable bodies or rigid bodies is indeed valid and can uh, very handy as well. Okay, so that's our preamble. Um, there are four subheadings in this chapter one, multi-body mechanical systems, types of analysis and methods of formulation as well as computer programs. Okay, so with that said, let's dive into the first subheading, multi-body mechanical systems. And here we will look at a few definitions. We'll also look at what the most common components of a multi-body systems are. And we will be looking at studying a multi-body system. What does it involve? Okay, so first of all, definitions. We can define what is called or referred to as a simple body multi-body mechanical system, for example, a pendulum or a slider crank. Similarly, we can distinguish then between simple and a complex multi-body mechanical system. That's our second definition. And the examples we can list here are, for example, car suspension, car steering, a walking robotic device, and an exercise machine. Now, that's dif differentiating between simple and complex multi-body systems. Another definition, and that is something that we will use extensively in this module and this uh, textbook, is what is referred to as planar or two-dimensional multi-body mechanical systems, as opposed to what is referred to as a spatial or three-dimensional multi-body mechanical system. Let's look at a planar or two-dimensional um, multi-body mechanical system. Firstly, we can say that these uh, mechanical systems have bodies that can only move in what is referred to or what are parallel planes. Okay? It's also possible that all the bodies move in a single plane. That will also qualify um, the mechanical system as a planar multi-body mechanical system. All right, now the motion of some spatial systems, which we will define in a minute, um, if projected onto a plane, could also be approximated as being planar. All right, so it is indeed a useful uh, type of multi-body mechanical system to analyze. It is indeed very useful. Okay. So, for completeness sake, what are spatial or three-dimensional mechanical systems? Um, these bodies do not have 
do not move in parallel planes and the example we can give here is a robotic device that is capable of operating in all three dimensions it's typically robot arms that you will find in a, in a car assembly line would qualify as a spatial or three-dimensional multi-body system that's the definitions so the most common components in multi-body systems are firstly bodies also referred to as links there are also kinematic joints compliance elements and then the multi-body system may also contain non-mechanical components okay so let's firstly look at bodies um, the bodies or links can in most multi-body systems be considered as non-deformable now you will remember in the preamble we refer to non-deformable bodies as being rigid and we emphasize that in some uh, analyses this assumption of a non-deformable bodies is indeed useful and gives accurate enough results however in some applications the deformation of a link may not be negligible and should be considered in the analysis all right so that's obviously falls outside of the scope of this module and course um, okay so that's bodies or links uh, kinematic joints the examples we can list are pins sliders gears cam followers and there are others as well now compliance elements are you get springs and dampers okay so collectively kinematic joints and compliance elements provide connectivity between the bodies of a system and that's obviously very important in our study of multi-body uh, mechanical systems all right so that's uh, kinematic joints compliance elements there may also be non-mechanical components forming part of the multi-body system for example an electronic controller why is this important to mention well um, when we analyze the dynamics of such a system we must also include an analytical model of the controller all right so that's just for uh, accurate analysis this is obviously very important okay now let's look at the study of multi-body systems it involves two fundamental steps first of all modeling or formulation and secondly analysis so for modeling or formulation what is it it is the process of constructing the necessary equations that if solved would reveal the behavior of the system now in the planar multibody dynamics textbook several methods of formulation are considered each having its own advantages and disadvantages in this module we will consider a specific formulation which is uh, defined and titled in the planar multibody dynamics textbook as body coordinate formulation okay but we'll touch on that and dive into the details of that in a later lecture right so that's um, the first step in studying multi-body systems the second step is analysis now different types of analysis could be considered depending on the application of a multi-body system all right so that just gives an overview um, of multi-body systems now the second subheading types of analyses all right the two aspects to study of a mechanical system are analysis and design or synthesis okay so analysis when a mechanical system is acted upon by a given excitation for example an external force the system exhibits a certain response now the process of studying the response of an already existing system to a known excitation is called analysis analysis requires a complete knowledge 
of the physical characteristics of a mechanical system such as the material composition, shape and the arrangement of parts. All right. Now, that's analysis. Design or synthesis is the process of determining the physical characteristics that are necessary for a mechanical system to perform a prescribed path. The design process requires the application of scientific techniques as well as engineering judgment. Uh, examples of scientific techniques are analysis and optimization. So, the scientific techniques in the design process, such as analysis and optimization, are merely tools to be used by the engineer. Hence, it is important to learn about methods of analysis prior to design. Okay, that's, this just emphasizes the importance of what we are teaching in this module and what has been uh, so thoroughly described in the planar multibody dynamics textbook. Okay, analysis is critically important for the design engineer. Okay, so that's scientific techniques that's required in, during the design process. The second um, idea or concept here is engineering judgment. So although the, the design process can be applied in a systematic manner, the overall design process hinges on the judgment of the designer. The decisions you make as designer determines the process that you will follow. Okay. Alright, so that's the two aspects, analysis, design, synthesis that we looked at. Now the branch of analysis that studies motion, time and force is called mechanics, which consists of statics and dynamics. Statics, in statics we analyze stationary systems, in other words systems in which time is not a factor. Whereas in dynamics, uh, we deal with systems that are non-stationary, in other words systems that change their positions with respect to time. Alright, dynamics is on, furthermore divided into two disciplines. And that is kinematics and kinetics. All right. It is however common to refer to kinematic analysis as dynamic analysis. All right. Because, and um, sorry, let me just go back one step. What? Let's just, before we wrap up, and show how kinematics and kinetics are uh, linked. Let's just first dive into a bit more detail in terms of what, what are kinematics. Kinematics, or what is kinematics? Kinematics is the study of motion regardless of the forces that produce the motion. More explicitly, kinematics is the study of displacement, velocity, and acceleration. Alright, that's kinematics. So, Motion regardless, the study of motion regardless of the forces that produce the motion. So it then follows that kinetics is the study of motion and its relationship with the forces that produce the motion. Okay, and now we're ready to, um, to look at how these kinematics and kinetics are linked. Okay. It is, however, very common to refer to kinetic analysis as dynamic analysis, all right? Because kinetic analysis must be based on the knowledge of kinematics of a system as well. Therefore, in the planar multibody dynamics textbook, the term dynamic is used instead of kinetic. The Planar Multibody Dynamics textbook also discusses several computational methods of analysis. For example, kinematic analysis, inverse dynamic analysis, forward dynamic analysis, static and static equilibrium analysis. 
So in this module we'll look at kinematic analysis. If you remember, the study of motion regardless of the forces that cause the motion. Inverse dynamics and forward dynamics are different types of dynamic analysis. So in these analyses we will do the kinematics as well as the kinetics. In other words, the motion as well as the forces that produce the motion. Don't worry too much about the, the difference between inverse and forward dynamic analyses. We'll get to that in a later lecture. All right. Static analysis, static equilibrium, that if, if you are interested, you are welcome to then also um, do that on your own self-study uh, as part of this, well, from the textbook. Okay, so that is dynamics and that was um, the second branch of mechanics which we just spoke about okay so let's look at subsection 1.3 methods of formulation Nikravesh distinguishes between classical methods of analysis in mechanics and then more modern solution techniques so in terms of classical methods of analysis in mechanics, these methods have relied upon graphical and often quite complex techniques. And you'll see in a little bit just how complex it becomes for even a very simple mechanism. These techniques are mostly based on geometrical interpretations of the system under consideration. Furthermore, these techniques have been developed for hand derivation and solution of the equations. So mistakes can easily slip in. All right, then some of these classical methods of analysis in mechanics can be implemented in computer programs, which is obviously in the modern day we're living in very important. That's classical methods of analysis. However, more modern solution techniques can take full advantage of the capabilities of computational methods. And that's also very relevant and important for us in this study okay so in this section 1.3 that we are currently discussing and that's also part of the textbook the planar multibody dynamics textbook um, this section provides an overview of some of the formulation methods that are discussed in the textbook as a whole okay and we will make reference to uh, the sections in other words that will come later on in the in the module okay so so how does it give an overview of some of the formulation methods that are discussed it does so through several simple examples okay and we will talk about there are two specifically that we will discuss in a lot of detail now in discussing the examples the planar multibody dynamics textbook does not discuss the details of each method or how a set of equations has been derived. Instead, the objective is to realize that there is more than one way to formulate the problem for a particular form of analysis. All right, so without further ado, um, let's look at example one. Okay. This is a very simple slider crank mechanism. It's shown in figure 1.1 in the textbook and obviously also on the screen. So the link lengths are L1 0,2 meter. This is L1. This is the crank. Uh, L2 is 0,4 meter. And the rotation of the crank, in other words, this is now link 1 or link 0A or OA, depending on how you want to refer to it. This is the crank, it has a rotation speed uh, of 1,5 radians per second. Okay. So assume that our objective is to determine the position, velocity and acceleration of the connecting rod, which is link 2 or link AB, and the slider body, 3. Okay. So, position, velocity, acceleration of the connecting rod and the slider at a configuration where the crank, 
this is now this body one makes an angle of 30 degrees with the horizontal axis okay for our analysis we define the angles of links one and two with respect to the horizontal axis as theta one and theta two okay and in the figure you can see theta one over here and theta two over there and it's with it's relative to the horizontal uh, axis okay the position of the slider with respect to point o is defined as d okay and this is shown here also clearly in figure 1.1 now since we are not interested in the forces that cause or are the result of this motion the process is purely a kinematic analysis if you remember what we said earlier okay the solution there are different forms of the solution are presented there are different forms of the solution possible and these different forms are presented here in a general form without explaining the details of implementation all right so let's have a look solution one now we're referring back to the or we are applying the classical graphical technique of kinematic analysis solution two we'll discuss in a little bit that's the classical analytical formulation for kinematics of planar mechanism which is also known as the vector loop method but we'll talk about this in a little bit let's first consider the classical graphical technique of kinematic analysis okay for the position analysis okay the triangle OAB depicted in figure 1.2a is drawn as accurately as possible since the lengths of OA and AB and the angle of the crank are given okay and that's shown here in figure 1.2a we've got the link length OA AB and we've got this angle now this process reveals that there are two solutions for the given data the constructed triangle could either be OAB okay indicated with the solid lines or OAB apostrophe okay so B can either be on this side or on this side now although both solutions are feasible Based on the original diagram, we choose point B to represent the position of the slider. Now, for the constructed triangle, by measurements, we now determine that D, this distance D, is, in other words, from point O to point B, that distance is 0 0.53 meter, and the angle theta 2 in other words from the horizontal to link a b is 165 degrees now this completes the graphical position analysis for this mechanism in the specified configuration so to perform the velocity analysis for the given of an orientation of the slider crank a velocity vector polygon is constructed as shown here in figure 1.2 b now this polygon is constructed based on the results from the position analysis in other words the orientation of the links and the given angular velocity of the crank as omega 1 equals 1 1.5 radians per second in a counterclockwise direction the polygon shows the velocity of point A or V superscript A, the velocity of the slider, which is the velocity of point B, and it's indicated as V superscript B, as well as the velocity of point A relative to point B or V superscript AB as indicated here in the diagram. So we measure the magnitude of VB by measuring this vector and that gives us 0 0.21 meters per second to the left. Okay, and we can obviously it's to the left because this is the direction of the arrow. And we also know 
that uh, we can geometrically see that if the crank rotates counterclockwise, the slider will move towards the left hand side. Now, based on the measured magnitude VAB and the length of link AB, we can determine the angular velocity of the connecting rod to be omega 2 equals 0 0.6 radians per second clockwise. Okay. <clears throat> um, right, that's the velocity analysis. All right, now similar to the velocity analysis, an acceleration polygon can be drawn for the acceleration analysis. And this is shown here in figure 1.2c. Now, this polygon is constructed based on the results of the position and velocity analyses and the given angular acceleration of the crank as being alpha 1 equals 0 because the crank is rotating at a constant angular velocity. Now, the acceleration polygon shows the acceleration of point A or vector A superscript A, the acceleration of the slider, which is determined through direct measurement as the vector A superscript B equals 0 0.51 meters per second, and also to the left. The polygon also shows the acceleration of point A relative to point B as this vector A superscript A comma B. And then based on the measured mag magnitude of this vector A superscript AB and the length of link AB, we determine the angular acceleration of the connecting rod to be alpha 2 equals 0 0.4 radians per second in a counterclockwise direction. Right. So, we can definitely say one big advantage of the graphical process is that it provides a visual understanding of the kinematics of the system. It is a graphical process or graphical method in per se. So, we understand um, how the mechanism moves and we can also, by drawing the polygons, understand what the directions of the accelerations and velocities are. Okay, but there are distinct disadvantages. The process is not accurate. Okay, and the reason for that is the accuracy of the results from a position analysis depends on how accurate we draw the lines and circles and on the accuracy of the measurement of the lengths and angles. So, how accurately do we draw and measure? Okay, the measurement errors for the position analysis will be included and transferred in the measuring measurement errors from the corresponding velocity polygon and will further be magnified in the results of the acceleration polygon. Therefore, the overall results from a graphical analysis cannot be very accurate. Okay, that's the accuracy. Now, the process could also become impractical if we need to repeat the process for many different configurations. So, if you, we consider the example where the crank angle was 30 degrees, if we now want to investigate or determine what the, or we want to do a kinematic analysis of the mechanism at another angle, we have to repeat the whole process. So it's a tedious process, process. And it is not accurate, as we just said. Okay. Now, that was... That was solution one. Now, let's look at solution two. Which is a classical analytical formulation for kinematics of planar mechanism mechanisms which is also known as the vector loop method okay so the kinematic analysis consists of position velocity and acceleration so let's look at each of these three in a bit more detail now for the slider crank mechanism of figure 1.1 and it's again shown here on this screen the vector loop method remember that's another name for the 
classic analytical approach, the vector loop method requires constructing algebraic relationships between the defining variables. Okay, and if you remember, we said earlier that the link lengths are as follows, L1 0.2 meter, L2 0.4 meter, and the rotation of the crank, which is this link over here, OA or link number 1, is 1.5 radians per second in a counterclockwise direction. Okay. Um, yes. Okay, so just to go back to this uh, idea or bullet point over here, the vector loop method requires constructing algebraic relationships between the defining variables. The defining variables are theta1, the crank angle, theta2, this angle between the slider and the connecting rod, and obviously the position of the slider, D. Okay, and now obviously... Uh, in order to do this algebraic relationships in terms of those defining or between the defining variables or in terms of the defining variables, we obviously know to, need to know the lengths of the links as I've said um, in discussing this bullet point over here. So now we can um, generate or create the vector loop for the closed triangle O A B O okay and it yields the following equations 0 0.2 cosine of theta 1 minus 0 0.4 cosine of theta 2 minus d equals 0 and 0 0,2 sine theta 1 minus 0 0,4 sine theta 2 equals 0 now for the crank angle theta 1 equals 30 degrees these two equations can be solved for the two unknown variables, theta2 and d. Right? The method of solution for such nonlinear non algebraic equations is discussed in a later chapter in planar multibody dynamics. Now, such a solution provides theta2 equals 165,5 degrees and the length d is 0 0.5606 meters okay that's the position analysis now let's look at the velocity analysis for the velocity analysis the time derivative of equation 1.1 provides the velocity equations as follows okay and i'm not going to read out the equations you can see it here on the screen it's simply the time derivative of these two equations. Now, knowing the values of theta 1, theta 2, and omega 1, the velocity equations can then be solved for omega 2 as minus 0 0.6708 radians per second, and the velocity of the slider VB, vector V superscript B, is minus 0 0.21711. And now the, the negative sign uh, indicates that the slider is moving to the left. And this negative omega 2 indicates that the um, angular velocity is in a clockwise direction. Counterclockwise will be positive, clockwise will be negative. Okay. Um, as, and this correlates obviously to what we've just said about the graphical method. All right, that's the velocity analysis. Now let's look at the acceleration analysis. For the acceleration analysis, the time derivative of equation 1.2 provides the acceleration equations as follows. Okay, and this is given by equation 1.3, and you can already see, even for this very simple example taking the second time derivative it becomes a long equation and it's very easy to make a, a, a mistake in deriving this by hand okay but nonetheless there they are I mean if you work systematically you can obviously do it accurately as well so knowing the values of theta 1 theta 2 omega 1 omega 2 and alpha 1 as 0 
the acceleration equations are solved for determining or to determine the two unknowns as alpha 2 equals 0 0.4648 radians per second squared. The fact that it's positive indicates it's counterclockwise. And the acceleration of the slider equals the second time derivative of d. And that's equals, that equals minus 0 0.5175 meters per second squared. The minus once again indicate that the slider is accelerating towards the left hand side of the figure. Okay, I think I've... Yes, so this classical method of kinematic analysis of planar mechanical systems is reviewed in Nikravesh's textbook in chapter 5. Although it is possible to solve the position, velocity and acceleration equations of simple systems using pencil and paper, the equations are more suitable for development into a computer program. Alright, what are the advantages of this classical analytical method? The computed values obviously are much more accurate than those obtained graphically. The computational process could furthermore very easily be repeated for different values of the crank angle. Now, in Nikravesh's textbook, several other methods of analytical formulation for the kinematics of multi-body systems are also discussed. All right, and we'll touch on some of them. Uh, or those, let me rather say this, those that we are going to... Uh, uh, develop further we will look at in a lot more detail this uh, overview is just to sensitize you to the fact that there are many different ways of doing kinematic and dynamic analysis okay there are also disadvantages um, associated with the classical method of kinematic analysis and that is as I've already touched on or pointed out the derivation of the analytical equations for, kin for the kinematic analysis of even this simple mechanism is definitely not trivial. Okay, it is definitely not trivial and you can make a mistake if you are not careful. Alright. Now, let me just zoom out a little bit. That was solution 2. Okay. Right, so that's the first example, the slider crank. Now let's look at the second example. And following on that last point I've made, the, the fact that deriving the analytical acceleration equations for that very simple mechanism is already, they are long equations. They are quite, in, well, not quite involved, but they're not trivial. Okay, so following the argument that... Uh, Derivation of the kinematic equations of motion for a very simple mechanism is definitely not considered to be trivial. Uh, let's look at this example too. Now, so far the discussion has concentrated on kinematic analysis of multi-body systems. Kinematic analysis. In other words, position, velocity and acceleration. Now, to discuss the methods of formulation for dynamic analysis of multi-body systems, we consider a simpler example than a slider crank mechanism. Even simpler, okay? And I just want to revert you or uh, point you back to the fact that the slider crank is by no means a complex mechanism, and yet the equations of motion for the kinematic analysis is non-trivial. The dynamic equations of motions is more difficult and more involved. Okay, so we take a step back. We take a simpler mechanism, even simpler than the slider crank mechanism. Um, the example is a double pendulum. It's shown in figure 1.3a. Now the pendulum is composed of two slender rods, OA and AB. OA is pinned to ground at O 
and link A, B, or number 2, link 2 rather, is pinned to link 1 at A. Okay. The link lengths are L1 equals 2 meters and L2 equals 1,5 meters. Now the mass and moment of inertia of each link are um, M1 3 kilograms, J1 that's just the moment of inertia, 1 kilogram meter squared, and the mass of link 2 is 1,6 kilograms, and the inertia of link 2 is 0 0,8 kilogram meter squared. Now, gravity is the only force that acts on the system, and we're using the SI units, uh, meaning that gravity is 9,81 meters per second squared. Now the mass centers, or C of G, center of gravities, are at the geometric centers of the links. Okay? And that you can clearly see here in the figure. This is uh, the mass center G1. For link 1 is in the center of the link length. And G2, the C of G of link number 2, is at the center of the link length. Now, it is assumed that the configuration shown in figure 1.3a, which, uh, which I just had in view, okay, so this configuration, theta 1, 30 degrees, theta 2 is 45 degrees. Okay, so that's our consideration. Are orientated from the vertical axis, axis by angles 30 and 45 degrees. Okay, and... The links have initial angular velocities of theta 1 dot 0 0.5 radians per second, theta 2 dot minus 0 0.4 radians per second. So this will be a clockwise, sorry, this will be counterclockwise, 0 0.5 counterclockwise, that's positive, okay, and um, this will be clockwise. Because it's negative. That's what it implies. Alright. So Nikrovich in his textbook Planar Multibody Dynamics then constructs the equations of motion for this system in several forms for comparison. Okay, number one. The first method of formulating the equations of motions for the double pendulum is based on the classical free body diagram or FBD of system sorry, free body diagram method or free body diagram of this system as shown in figure 1.3b. Um, we, we will look at the other two solutions, the free body diagram representation yielding only two equations of motion and the free body diagram representation of a system of particles a little bit later. So now we first look at the free body the classical free body diagram of the system. Okay, it's shown in figure 1.3b. Okay, so we draw the two links separately and we indicate obviously the C of G and the forces and reaction forces that act on the bodies. But we'll discuss that in, in the next few seconds. The weights of the links are shown as omega Oh, sorry, not omega, W1 and W2. Okay, the X and Y components of the reaction forces at the pin joints are shown as lambda 1, lambda 2 in over here, lambda 3 and lambda 4. Oh, they obviously act in opposite directions on the two bodies. Now, some of the distances that are needed in the equations of motion are computed as follows. Okay, and that's also shown here in the diagram. So, A equals L1 over 2 multiplied by the cosine of theta 1, and that is 0 0.87. Similarly, B is 0 0.5 meter, C is 0 0.53 meter, here on this on the right hand side of figure 1.3b and the distance d is also 1,053 meters.
Now, considering that the two mass centers have coordinates x1, y1 for body 1 or link 1 and x2, y2 for link 2, then based on the free body diagrams of the two links, the following six equations can be constructed. Okay, and that's given by equation 1.4. The two links also having constant lengths yield four more equations as follows. We already have six. There are four additional equations. That's given by equation 1.5. I'm not going to read them out. Uh, just for now, for the argument's sake, we know the number of equations, not exactly how they were derived. Okay, so the important thing is that in these ten equations, since the positions and velocities are known, there are 10 unknowns. Okay? 6 accelerations and 4 component, components of reaction forces. The 10 equations can be solved for the 10 unknowns, yielding the following results. Okay? And you can see the values over there. Um, the acceleration of body 1 in the x direction, y direction, angular acceleration of body 1, x and y accelerations of body 2, the angular acceleration of body 2, and then the reaction forces lambda 1, 2, 3, and 4. And obviously, um, our sign convention holds, so positive x is towards the right, negative towards the left, positive y upwards, negative y downwards, positive angular a positive, positive angle is counterclockwise and a negative angle or angular velocity or angular acceleration is clockwise. Okay, and then the, these reaction forces um, in the direction that we've drawn them, uh, if these answers were positive, it means that those reaction forces are indeed in the directions drawn. And if they are negative, they are in the opposite direction. Okay, so that's just a side comment. The point here is we've got 10 equations with 10 unknowns. We can solve them to get all the values for the configuration we are considering. Um, I just want to zoom out a little bit. Okay, yes. All right, so... So the use of three body diagrams for constructing the equations of motions of motion rather for dynamic analysis of planar mechanical systems is reviewed in detail in chapter 6. Okay? And we'll also deal with that in this module. The process is then extended for systematic generation of equations of motions of motion rather in chapter 7. Okay? And that's also very important and that's actually where we are heading with this module. A general purpose MATLAB program based on this formulation is discussed in chapter 8 of Nick Rebesh's textbook. And we will in this module look at how this program has been adapted and implemented inside FreeCAD using Python coding. Uh, and it's implemented as a dedicated FreeCAD workbench. And in recognition of Prof. Nikravesh's magnificent contribution, we call this workbench NikraDAP. Nikra, short for Nikravesh, and DAP for uh, an acronym for Dynamic Analysis Program. So, with that said, uh, that was the first method of formulating the equations of motion for the double pendulum okay based on the classic free body diagram method now the second solution or the second formulation is then the free body diagram representation yielding only two equations of motion all right so if we look at that the free body diagrams ob obviously remain the same now, since the double pendulum that we are considering has only two degrees of freedom, which is, which are rather the orientation 
or the rotation of link 1 about uh, point O as well as the rotation of link 2 about point A. So those are the two degrees of freedom, the rotations of the two bodies. It is then possible to construct only two equations representing the equations of motion for this multi-body system. And what does that look like? Okay, that's given in equation 1.7. Alright, the method of formulation that resulted in equation 1.7 is discussed in detail in chapter 9 of Prof. Nikravesh's textbook. And a MATLAB program based on this formulation is also provided for download and briefly discussed at the end of chapter 9. Okay, we're not going to deal with this formulation, but for those of you who are interested, you are very welcome to uh, have a look at it. Okay, that was the second. Uh, I must just have a look. Yes, sorry, I almost jumped the gun. Okay, so substituting all the known quantities in these two equations, including the initial conditions, the two equations can be solved for the rotational accelerations as follows. Okay, and we get exactly the same angular or rotational accelerations as before. Now, knowing the rotational accelerations of the links, we can determine the linear accelerations of the mass centers if needed. If we are interested in knowing the values of these forces, they can be com computed after the accelerations have been determined. Okay, of the reaction forces, I think that's what it should read. So the reaction forces can also be calculated. Okay, so that's a compact version of the free body diagram formulation. Now let's have a look at the free body representation of a system of particles. Okay, in another formulation, uh, we can consider the double pendulum as a system of two particles A and B as shown in figure 1.4A over here. Okay, the distances between particle A and point O and particles A and B are known constants because we know the original link lengths. Now this presentation requires the masses, moment of inertia, and applied forces, in other words weights in this example, to be properly distributed to the particles. The free body diagram representation of the two particles is shown in figure 1.4b over here. Now where the reaction forces acting on the particles along the axes of the links are represented by lambda 1 and lambda 2. That's the reaction forces acting on the particles along the axis of the links. Now the free body diagram provides the following set of equations. That's given by equation 1.9 and as you can see once again six equations um, okay, just before we, yeah, well, let's discuss it now. Okay, so for these equations, for these six equations, the coordinates and velocities are determined as follows. Okay, so now we're talking about uh, the coordinate of point A, uh, the velocities of A and B. Okay. Substitute, substituting these values in equation 1.9 and then solving the equations for the unknown accelerations and reaction forces yield okay, the accelerations and reaction forces. And the acceleration of the mass centers of the links can then be determined as follows. All right, and there you can see the values that were calculated and the manner in which it was calculated. Now these values are exactly the same as those obtained for the method given in equation 1.6, okay, which is what we expected it to be. It's just a different formulation. And as I said, we're not going into the details of how we formulate and how we solve the equ equations. We are just merely pointing you to the different formulations. And for those of you who are interested, obviously the details of this method of formulation, this latter method of formulation, are 
um, is discussed in detail in chapter 10 of Prof. Nekravish's textbook. Right, so with that said, we've, we've now looked at different formulations of the uh, double pendulum. This was our example 2. Okay, and we also considered the kinematic analysis of example 1. Okay, so what to wrap up what we just looked at. The slider crank, crank and double pendulum examples demonstrated that a multi-body system could be formulated in different ways. If the principles of mechanics are followed and no approximations are considered, all of the formulations should lead to the same results. Okay, and that we also saw, okay, a problem that is formulated analytically and developed into a computer program can be solved repeatedly, accurately, and efficiently. The usefulness of a computer program becomes even more apparent when the mechanical system under consideration contains numerous interconnected components. Regardless of the complexity of the equations of motion, we should be able to find a numerical solution describing the response. And that is indeed the case, and that is what we will discover in, uh, in, the, course, in, the, yeah, in the course of this module. Okay, so to wrap up this introductory chapter of planar multibody dynamics, let's look at subheading 1.4, dealing with computer programs. To start off with, analytical methods for formulating the equations of motion and numerical methods for solving the equations of motion are the basis for developing computer programs to determine the response of a multi-body system. And this is obviously a very important statement. Um, we've shown with these very simple examples earlier in this lecture that deriving the equations of motions, even for simple mechanisms, are not trivial. Solving them analytically with a pencil and paper is a further challenge. It is not simple to do. So, we have, the, um, we have computers available, so it absolutely makes sense to develop computer programs for solving or determining the response of a multi-body system. It is absolutely a no-brainer to do that. What does it require? It requires three things. Firstly, systematic techniques for formulating and generating the kinematic and dynamic equations of motions. A systematic technique to do that. Secondly, numerical methods for solving the equations of motion. And finally, or thirdly, we also need preferably a front-end graphical interface for communicating the input and output to the user. If we have these three, these three things, we can indeed develop computer programs to determine the response of a multi-body system. Okay, now what does such a program look like it can be developed as one of two options a special purpose program or a general purpose program okay so what is a special pur purpose program this is computer code that deals with one particular multi-body system for example we can write a special purpose program to do the dynamic analysis of the slider crank mechanism that we spoke about earlier in this lecture we can also develop a special purpose program for any other multi-body system. And in this module and in this textbook, we deal with planar multi-body systems. So one such unique mechanism is what I call a planar reconfigurable Gauss Stewart machining platform. This mechanism is very dear to me. It is the topic of my PhD research more than 20 years ago and it is also the topic of my current research and development efforts so uh, and i will show you what this mechanism looks like and how it functions and what's unique 
about the special purpose program that I developed for it and how it functions. That I'll do at the end of the lecture. Okay, so that's special purpose program. The equations of motion for such a system, for whatever mechanism we want to analyze, are derived a priori and coded in the program. Okay? As an input to the program, the user provides the data on the physical characteristics of the system. Okay? And then obviously the program will uh, calculate the response of that mechanism. So uh, the user need, needs to develop the equations of motions a priori and give uh, data on the physical characteristics also as an input. What are the advantages of a special purpose program? Mainly that, and this is what Nikravis points out in planar multibody dynamics, the fact that the numerical algorithms for solving the equations of motion can be fine-tuned for that particular form of equations to gain computational efficiency. The disadvantage on the other side is that a special program, purpose program lacks flexibility for analyzing any other mechanical system. Okay, for my, and this is absolutely true, for my PhD research, it took me three years to finish my PhD research. And the bulk of the work happened in the last year. So one can argue it took me the best part of 12 months to develop that special purpose program. So a long development time, sure, the, the next mechanism you develop a special purpose program for will take a lot quicker. But um, it is, there are very solid reasons for developing this computer program as a general purpose program. All right. So let's quickly have a look at that. Um, the, the first main advantage, and this is I've, I've already alluded to, is the fact that the general purpose program can analyze different multibody systems without requiring any changes to the program. Okay, that is a huge advantage. Okay, so surely to develop the general purpose program is a lot of work up front, but once you have it, you've got flexibility in terms of the mechanisms that you want to analyze. For example, you can analyze the motion of a slider crank mechanism under a given set of applied loads. You can analyze the response of an automobile and its suspension system drive, driven over a rough terrain or opening the opening of panels of a satellite antenna. And this list is by no means complete. Any type of mechanism that you can think of and you want to design, you can do the analysis of if you have a, a reliable general purpose program. Okay, the input data to such a program must completely describe the mechanical system under consideration. For example, you need to specify the number of bodies, the connectivity between the bodies, the joint types, the applied forces, the geometric characteristics, the sizes in other words, as well as the inertial characteristics, the mass and moment of inertia. Okay, based on the given data, the program then generates the equations of motion for the requested type of analysis and solves the equations numerically. Now, the disadvantage that Nikravis points out is the fact that the general purpose program may not be computationally as efficient as a special purpose program. Okay, so with that said, um, the good news is the formulations and methodologies that are discussed in the Planar Multibody Dynamics textbook can be used to develop either special or general purpose programs. The choice of programming platform is also completely up to us or up to you as a, as a user. Okay, in the Multibody Dynamics textbook, Nikravis exclusively uses MATLAB as his programming language of choice. Now in the MSD or play, uh, Dynamics Postgraduate Dynamics course or module, we will use Python. Okay, 
and the main objective of this textbook and the module, the postgraduate dynamics module, is to learn analytical and computational methods for kinematics and dynamics. Okay, so to end of the lecture, just to answer the burning question, what is a planar reconfigurable Gauss Stewart machining platform? So what you see on the left is a schematic representation of a, just a planar Gauss Stewart platform. On the right is a photograph of a test model that I've built, designed, built and tested as part of my PhD research. How this mechanism works, it's got three actuator legs. Each of the, the, the legs pivot about the base. Okay, so these are pivots or hinges. And the legs also pivot about the, or the moving platform, depending on how you look at it. But there's a relative rotation or a pivot between the moving platform and the actuator legs as well. Okay. A very simple mechanism. Um, the test model was uh, reconfigurable in the sense that the distance between the pivots on the base, so this distance over here, in other words, represented by distance DE on the left, and this distance over here, represented by distance CD, as well as this distance here at the top, represented by AB, all those three distances could be adjusted. All right. And how it worked, my special purpose dynamic analysis program implemented trajectory planning as well as design configuration optimization. The trajectory planning was needed to specify the path that we wanted. Uh, here in the middle there is a pin. And this pin then traces the prescribed traje trajectory onto a perspex plate, a transparent perspex plate. Right, but before we execute or trace the, the prescribed path, we do an offline analysis and optimization using the special purpose dynamic analysis program. Right, so let me just show you on the next slide. This is one example of a prescribed path. It's a treble cliff. It had a start point and an end point. And the way that I've programmed the trajectory planning portion of the special purpose program was the user only needed to specify uh, points, coordinates of uh, individual points along the path. That, uh, as well as then obviously, <coughs> excuse me, the ta maximum tangential acceleration. That's the acceleration as along the along the tangent of the path or along the path. So as we move from zero from rest along the path, the tangentially we cannot exceed an, uh, an acceleration of 0 0.01 meters per second square. And similarly, the maximum tangential speed you can specify, um, as well as for this, for our mechanism, we need to specify what is the orientation of the moving platform as it traces the path. And there we had the option to specify either a fixed orientation, like in this example, or you could uh, specify that the orientation of the moving platform needs to be uh, adjusted or uh, yes, adjusted based on the slope of the prescribed path. So both options were available. Um, let me just show you. Um, so, okay, so. In terms of the, the design configuration optimization, um, I defined five values that, or five parameters for which you had to select values in order to specify the, uh, the configuration, the design configuration. Now those five values, if I can just jump back here, uh, the first three are easy to identify the, the distance between these two pivots on the moving platform. That's one value or parameter that you need to set. 
Uh, similarly, this distance between the, these two pivots on the base, that's the second value. Then the third value is this distance between these two pivots. All right. Um, now, the fourth and fifth values um, relate the, or, or specifies the placement of the prescribed path relative to the, move, to the mechanism. The placement, the x, y coordinates of the um, uh, prescribed path relative to the to the mechanism because each of these um, pivots, the coordinates of each of those pivots are obviously specified relative to a coordinate system and similarly the the um, the uh, yeah the origin if you like of this prescribed path is then also placed relative to the uh, x y coordinate system that is defined in for the mechanism all right so those are the five parameters the initial values that you see here um, 0 0.4 0 0.4 etc those were randomly selected okay and for this randomly selected initial design uh, what you see here on the left is the the actuator leg lengths as a as a function of time for actuator leg length one two three as well as the minimum allowable and maximum allowable actuator leg lengths and clearly you can see here the fact that um, the the fact that the the simulated actuator leg lengths lie above the maximum value implies that this these values assigned to the uh, design configuration are actually infeasible this mechanism if you were to try and execute it with the physical test model will not work it cannot work because it's impossible to get actuator lengths of above as you can see here above 0 0.8 meter um, now the the special purpose dynamic analysis program with the trajectory planning and the design optimization or artificial intelligence algorithm connected to it yielded a, a feasible design configuration and that's indicated here on the right you can clearly see the values are different to the values on the left and you can also see that the the fact or the the fact that it is feasible is is backed by the fact that the required actuator leg length variations now lie between the minimum and the maximum limits okay there's nothing above the maximum and nothing below the minimum allowed okay that's in a nutshell how it works um, this is just a photograph of the executed um, treble clef tool path which is the one we're looking at at the moment this measuring tape here is in centimeters and I will quickly show you a video the quality isn't great but um, it gives you the idea okay alright so there uh, is the start point of the treble clef um, I will this first part is not really very interesting the latter part is a bit more interesting let me fast forward it a little bit okay so it follows the whole trajectory all the way up down there it comes down and what you can notice now what is significant is um, in the special purpose dynamic analysis program with the optimization or artificial intelligence I avoided any mechanical interference and here you can see as the uh, lower part of the prescribed path is traced you can see some significant uh, angular adjustments without any mechanical interference okay so that's that path 
uh, let me just quickly also show you um, how the parameters or the design uh, parameters or variables as we call them are adjusted so this is a special attachment um, and that enables or allows the adjustment of the distance between these two hinges on the moving platform okay so um, it goes all the way and then the last bit of adjustment I did using a vernier just to get the sizes correctly okay so that's showing the adjustment between those two hinges um, I also have this video clip shows the adjustment of this distance the distance between these two hinges you can see I turn that lever over there let me fast forward it a little bit and once again I do the fine adjustments using a vernier okay and <clears throat> in exactly the same manner this adjustment can or this distance rather can also be adjusted let me fast forward that quickly and as with all the other distances I also use a vernier just for the final verification or final adjustments the fine tuning okay and then um, the last video clip that I would like to show you no uh, there, are, there are a few more so just bear with me this video clip shows uh, let me just pause it for a bit so um, in order once all the distances have been adjusted as per the um, optimization result or artificial intelligence result um, you you have to set the initial lengths of the legs okay and in this video clip I've already set the length of this leg as well as this leg over here and I'm now just setting the initial length of this um, leg 2 as I've uh, numbered them alright so that there's a limit switch glued to the um, vernier and uh, I press the button on the control system and then it makes the fine adjustment until that leg is the correct length okay now uh, what I would like to show you also is just some of the other um, uh, paths this is a, a what I call a spike path and in this case uh, the orientation of the moving platform varies uh, as the slope of the prescribed path changes okay so let me fast forward it a little bit so you can clearly see there this is some interesting part it remains or it changes its orientation along as the slope of the part of the prescribed path changes all right so that all goes all the way to the end and then it comes back it returns to zero all right um, there's another path over here this is a para parabola um, and once again the orientation of the moving platform let me just move this out of the way a little bit the orientation of the moving platform changes as the slope of the parabola changes okay and once again the tape measure is in inches so I think it was a 200 millimeter or yeah just over 10 inches 12 inches approximately 12 inches um, from end to end and this the moving platform orientation varied from 60 degrees clockwise in or 60 degrees counterclockwise relative to the horizontal to minus 60 degrees relative to the horizontal at the end okay um, there's one more yeah so I, I think that that suffices I can quickly show you um, I also implemented with the artificial intelligence algorithm 
um, of the late Professor Jan Sneijman. It's a very stable algorithm that we used. So what, what that means is it, it, if a feasible design is not possible, it gives you a compromise solution. And from that compromise solution, you can then make intelligent choices in terms of the prescribed path. Now, uh, I tested it using a, a, a bigger parabola that was infeasible. The, the, the test model of the Gaussian platform could not execute that large parabola. And, uh, but the offline, uh, the special purpose dynamic analysis program linked with the artificial intelligence algorithm gave a compromise solution and then I selected or I, I, I intervened and said no I want to execute this bigger parabola in three sections okay and what you see here is just a, uh, a, a com combination video of the successful execution of those three sections let me show you okay so this is the first section the I, I uh, typed a transparent plastic onto the Perspex plate okay and it executed the first portion I then I then adjusted I, I did another optimization or offline dynamic analysis program for the second section of the bigger parabola the optimization or the, the artificial intelligence gave a solution, a feasible solution. Uh, I obviously I had to adjust the five parameters physically on the test model. I also had to adjust the placement of the prescribed path relative to the uh, test model or mechanism. And that's what you see here or what you saw there. If I can just go back quickly. Yes, so that was the initial placement. This, the, the second placement is different now. And now we're executing the second portion of this path. Let me fast forward it a little bit. Okay, so it goes all the way. And then I used symmetry uh, to go back to that initial placement to execute the third portion of the prescribed path okay so that's basically what i wanted to show you uh, once again i do hope that you will sincerely enjoy postgraduate dynamics with me and uh, i thank you for trusting me on this journey thank you for watching